Tonight on Spectrum Hawaii, students throughout the state are experiencing the arts firsthand through educational outreach programs from the Hawaii Opera Theater and the Department of Education's Artists in the Schools program. But first... Music is a subjective topic, but by any standards, Roy Sakuma is the premier ukulele teacher in the state. But that doesn't mean he was a child prodigy. Everybody could play the ukulele. That was the end thing back then. And I, I probably was the only one that didn't know how to play or who, who tried to learn and who was so terrible at it. End of story, but that's the truth. I was probably the worst ukulele player I've ever seen. Period. <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> It was then that Roy heard the great ukulele player, Ora-san, and decided to take lessons from the master. I think I learned from him for about 18 months, and he told me it's time for me to go on my own. If teaching is what I wanted to do, then open up my own studio. And the funny thing is, I opened up my own studio with his blessings right next to his studio. <laughs> In 1973, Roy and Kathy Sakuma opened their first studio in Kaimuki, with the aim of offering students a new way to learn music. Our goal is to get students of any age to play first, uh, to get sound and, and satisfaction as quickly as possible. And it's kind of like teaching the spoken language of music because we found early on that by focusing on theory, it paralyzed to so many of our students and they would hit a wall. And I think the success of the studio is that anybody can come in and, and we're just gonna try and get them to play as quickly as possible. We're not just teaching them music, but we're trying to teach them to kind of open up, to get comfortable in our setting. We try to bring them out of their so-called shell because all of us as kids, we, we tend to have insecurities or we tend to have problems um, coping with certain areas of life. Now there are four Roy Sakuma Studios on Oahu with over 25 instructors. Over the years, thousands of people have come through our studios. I think the difference now with the resurgence of the ukulele is you'll find more teenagers. Before, when the kids got to like 12, 13, it wasn't too cool to continue playing ukulele. But now we've got kids, teenagers coming in and saying, hey, I want to play. Over the years, some of the students have formed groups that have done quite well for themselves. The termites, Roy started them back in 1973. At that time, 25 years ago, uh, you didn't see too many young talent being um, showcased or put out in public. There were no adult musicians helping them out on stage. There were just four boys, young boys, age 7 to 10, going out on stage and playing songs. When adults saw these kids, and parents especially, then they thought, gee, I'd like my child to be able to do something like that too. We never thought we could have another group as good as the termites. And the Super Keikis were, were started years after the termites retired. We said, OK, let's get a group of five uh, kids, five years old, and let them play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Well, they went on stage, and they played Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. They were such a hit. And they loved it so much that this group that we called the Super Keiki became you know, a great performing group. And we took them to Japan, to Disneyland. They'd play. Um, Danny Kalekini would invite them to do the Christmas show every year. And they had a great career. 
Joy, the girls in Joy, they were members of the Super Kiki, and usually by about 12 or 13, they'd start, you know, they'd want to stop. And that's when we'd bring new kids in. But these particular girls, when the time came, they didn't want to stop. They wanted to continue. We said, fine. And we thought, well, let's document them. Let's put them in the recording studio and let's document them. Roy is uh, he's, uh, generous to a fault. And he decided he would let them record an actual CD for the experience. And it came out during the recording sessions. He decided, boy, this is too good just to let go with two or three songs. We're going to really do a CD and release it commercially. So. It's such an important instrument in Hawaii, and Roy not only perpetuates the art of ukulele playing, but he teaches these kids music. Whether they know it or not, they learn chords and they learn uh, songs, and it's not just simple songs either. fun and it's once you get into it it's hard not to call it a part of your life you know I haven't met one person that despises music yet you know in 1971 Roy produced the first annual ukulele festival now in its 27th year, the festival showcases the ukulele with players from around the world. The whole purpose of the festival was to demonstrate the ability of this small little instrument that it wasn't just, not just used for strumming and Hawaiian music, but you could play the Beatles songs, you could do anything on the ukulele. We've had people like uh, James Ingram come and perform at our ukulele festival the great jazz guitarist, the late Howard Roberts, and the finest entertainers from Hawaii have all participated. How did we get involved in uh, record producing it? It's not, it wasn't anything um, planned or deliberate. It just, we just stumbled upon it. The Ka'au Creator Boys, Tropical Hawaiian Day, their first CD back in 19, when we released it, it was 1991. They made a big impact on the, the contemporary Hawaiian music. But the greatest impact on the future of ukulele music can come to a musician very early in life. I really feel that it's so very important for children to have that opportunity to have things where they can express themselves, be creative. And for learning to play the ukulele, for example, it's been such a tremendous help for so many kids throughout the lifetime that I've been teaching. You know, if you take that away from children, you're taking away what's a very important part of their growth. These kids are amazing. Just the way they respond to music, the way they, the way they behave, you, you just, they're off the wall comments. They're so open and honest. It's, it's the greatest thing to go to the studio every day and just to hang out with these kids and teach. We're teaching each other. That's it. I'm Eric Haynes and I'm the education and outreach manager for Hawaii Opera Theater and basically it's my job to come up with different types of education programs which marry opera and um, children. Our most um, comprehensive program is the mini residency in which basically we take an um, elementary school and turn it into an opera production company. It sounds simple but um, very complex. I knew it was big 
I knew there were a lot of things involved in this, uh, a lot of different people, um, different aspects of production, but I had no idea until I got into the middle of it. I'm Louise Sal, and I direct productions for Hawaii Upper Theater, children's productions. The onstage performers in this school auditioned. Large school, they have a very active theater and music group during school and after school, and so many of those auditioned, plus some who've never auditioned for anything before, auditioned. I was impressed with the auditions. So every child that auditioned was in the show. This means the group is very interested, very eager, and very willing to work. Well, what we're doing is we, we're doing a production of Macbeth, but the kids are doing it themselves. They, it started out when they came and saw Macbeth that we did at Hawaii Apple Theater. They saw the full performance. And then they came back and did a tour of the stage, and so they saw backstage how we got the opera on. And, and then I came out and I did a whole demonstration and spent a couple of hours with them showing what wigs and make, makeup can do, and now they're doing it themselves. The process is as important as the, if not more important, than the end product. Finding out what it's like to, to actually, all the work it is to get an, an opera on stage. And, and all the discipline of learning the music and learning the staging and working together. And, uh, and these kids especially are incredible. And it excites them in something they probably won't forget. A murderer has killed King Duncan. children's faces. I just love it. I love it when they come up and you know say hi what are we doing today even though sometimes I don't want where am I supposed to be now? <laughs> I still love it. Oh and they say we done good we did it we did it and then when they're on stage just giving it everything they've got singing the whole of the group it's just fun it's just fun to do. Everybody sees the final product and they think that's what the program is about. That's actually not what the program is about. What the program is about um, is teamwork. It's all these different st um, students and teachers doing all these different elements that have to come together successfully in order to have that final performance, that product. Um, so our goal is that all the learning is taking place before the production, doing all these different elements. Um, and one of our dreams is, is that after this production is over, if you gathered the entire school in their cafetorium and asked everybody to raise their hand, if they contributed in some way to this production, that everybody could raise their hand. Okay, well, at this point, we had a mass cutting day where several of the teachers, I would count about 14, we met in the library and we laid out 110 yards of fabric. We had all the patterns and we all were busy cutting and pinning and then we had a mass sewing day also where people brought their sewing, ma sewing machines and sergers and we were busy putting things together but these are some samples. This will be an outfit for one of our castle guests okay. and the women in those they did wear these fancy hat wear and the belts okay and this is for another castle noble and this is with um, blue velvet and they'll be wearing um, tights and long, long black pants as they did in the medieval period. So we did a lot of researching back in the medieval renaissance period and that way the students themselves generated pictures and then we created patterns and assembled and sewed and oh, we had to dress 60 children. So it was a task and we're still working on it. It took a while to get the kids into um, how to paint it so the effects would come out and trying to explain this to them. But what we did was I took this and um, I showed it to them and said, this is the set, we're in charge of sets. And they had just finished reading Tuck Everlasting, which is a really good children's book. And we did some dioramas on it. And the dioramas were based on um, a study of this. Okay, so you lift it a little. Okay. You try to bring in all the bring different in, um, areas as much as you can without really stretching it too far. So of course the, the art is there, of course, so you, try, you also try to tie it into language, which is our 
book Talk Everlasting, and you also tie it into other things that aren't academic but are life skills like responsibility and honoring commitments to do things on time and to also teach other basic skills like measurement and scale and just generally overall trying to give to the school what the school gives to you is what everything is all about with this production of Macbeth because they were doing it as a school not just a grade level. They've done a really good job and I'm really proud of it. Um, I think the most fun part is when you finally get to the to the end of that production and you see these kids who you've you've started with nothing and all of a sudden they've put all these different elements together and they walk onto the stage for the first time and their and their eyes just light up. I think music and the arts really enhances and pulls a school and its curriculum together. Uh, we've been really fortunate over the last few years to benefit from some funding through the Artists in the School program. Um, recently also that we've linked in the School to Work effort and we've gotten additional support there and we feel that um, arts can really give the children an opportunity to blossom, to grow in areas that um, a strictly academic curriculum um, cannot. I think um, it's a real critical time in their lives. I think as an elementary student, it's important for them to be open, be exposed to as much as they can. And if our role is to bring in these experiences, an experience like Macbeth can only enhance their lives. Um, it's something I think they will never forget, even when they become adults and parents. An experience in their elementary school years like this will really, I think, have a positive effect. Some of them may pursue the arts in their future. Some of them may not. But I think just having the exposure and the experience is going to be a real, real rewarding experience for them. LALE School is a very uh, unique and a special school in the sense that we're located on the far end of Kauai, on the West End, and due to the economic situation, our parents often have two or three jobs and they don't have the time to take their kids to um, experience this type of um, arts. So we need to change our strategy and bring the arts to them. So uh, the kids can be afforded that opportunity to experience what an opera is about, what a play is about, what a art project is about. So that's, that's the strategy. My name is Stephanie Conching, and I'm the education <laughs> coordinator here at Hawaii Opera Theater. Part of what my job is, uh, is to create education programs and to implement them. We do things like touring productions, where we'll, we'll go to uh, an elementary school site and perform a mini opera version or a specific opera that's been created for children. 
We actually toured with the largest set we've ever had. The Hansel and Gretel production has two backdrops. One is the Hansel and Gretel's cottage, and the other is the witch's house. And along with that, we have some kind of large props that are props people made. As the director, I, I was speaking to the kids to try to get them a little more involved in setting up the opera. So they helped us build the set a little bit. And instead of just knowing what, it, what an opera is, we wanted them to actually experience the opera. So that's why we had them help build the set and we had them touch the props and actually speak to the, the performers. <laughs> gives them an opportunity that they might not have at any other time in their life. When we do adult outreach, there are so many adults who, who say, if only I had had this experience when I was a kid, they might view life a little bit differently. You know, I, I love to hear 200 children laughing. Just the, the sound of that laughter is inspiring. You know, art right now at LA School is very much ingrained in our curriculum performance. By learning and exposing our kids to the different arts, they learn how to problem solve, they learn how to work together, they learn how to, um, to see creativity, um, and they learn how to watch that happen right in front of their faces so they can model it, so they can tie it into the curriculum. And so can the teachers. So when that is happening, it makes more sense and a more appreciation of the arts. To afford the kids a balanced curriculum, you, you have to look and be very proactive or innovative or whatever you might call it and go out there and get the outside resources. Art is an you know, uh, important part of our curriculum and we want to provide it for our kids and that's part of the long-term planning. In terms of um, art projects that you saw here today where the kids did a lot of hands-on type of art, that took a lot of planning too. And you can't sit back and grumble about the, the state of the economy. You need to go out there and go, go get grants, talk to your PTSA, talk to your business community about partnership. Yeah. Hawaii Opera Theater's educational outreach is funded in part through the Department of Education's Artists in the Schools program, which sponsors arts groups, artists in residence, and arts programs throughout the state. Their goal is nothing less than bringing the arts to every student in Hawaii. Kids, how are y'all doing today? At LA, the teachers were working with the ahupua. They were working with the environment. Um, we took the study of the reef area, the dryland forest, as well as the rainforest. The students studied that, and then they were to create a unique animal that's to be found nowhere else in the world. In creating their animal, again, they had to really think critically as well as creatively. So they had to state facts of the ecosystem. Like what did the animal eat? How fast would it move? What plants would be living in their environment? So they, they had to make a, a real connection with this and, and do some critical thinking. Um, to make the basic shape, I asked them to start with a pinch pot. And we created, we, we closed the form and we added pieces inside to make a rattle. So in the whole process, I wanted the, the students to not only um, learn about the rainforest or the ahupua'a, but to also learn all the ceramic skills that I could with hand building. And not, not to do just common ones, but to reach and try to um, do more difficult ones. The, to be able to make a closed form, to be able to make it into a rattle, and to be able to add pieces to it from scoring and knowing that it, they needed to be attentive and, and really try their best, all of them did. Any more questions? If okay. we give each student a chance to create and to express themselves, 
not to create a product that we want them to, but to create their own products that will be an expression of themselves. We're giving them a chance to rec recognize their own in individuality. You know, and when, when that happens, um, a, a tremendous amount of empowerment occurs.